Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Graciela. Um, I'm Jesse Sowell. I, uh, Graciela has already given me the introduction. I, um, I'm here with uh, generally with two hats on. My primary hat right now is my affiliation with MOG as Vice Chair of Growth and Development and Special Advisor to the Chairman, but I also am a, uh, will be starting a research fellowship at Stanford University's Center for International Security and Cooperation. So this, is a, so this opportunity to work with MOG and LACNIC is, uh, is great as a, a, a way for me to, to contribute to the community as well as supporting my research. So as Graciela mentioned, uh, the reason I'm here and the reason MOG is here is because we've recently established an agreement to work together mutually to fight online threats, cybersecurity issues, spam, abusive activities. But what MOG has really come to uh, speak with you about is that we're looking for your operational expertise. MOG has a great deal of expertise in anti-abuse work, but the real expertise in the LAC region is right in front of me. It's you in the audience, and we are um, looking forward to developing a relationship that we can garner, garner more of that experience, garner more of that operational knowledge to help us improve our best common practices such that they don't represent just our perspectives, but also represent the perspectives of the LAC region and hopefully a more global perspective. So I'm going to walk through a little bit about what the anti-abuse community is in general. Um, what is MOG as an organization? What is MOG's role in anti-abuse? And how you can contribute? And, we, and, that's, and that's really, I'm going to say this over and over again, we really want your participation. We really want your help to make these best common practices truly, truly global and truly representative of both the US, Europe, Latin America, Southeast Asia, the entire globe. So let's, let's look a little bit about anti-abuse dynamics. So when I was doing my dissertation work and I, and I came, out to, came out to LACNIC and, my and some of my first experiences were folks that said, ah, it's nice that you're out here and you're, and you're learning about the, the network operator groups in the LAC region and you're learning about the RIR, but you also have this other hat that you wear, this anti-abuse hat. How do, how do we get off these blocking lists? So one of the things that, one of the things that unfortunately network operator groups, the first contact with anti-abuse is when they get on a blocking list, they're like, oh my gosh, these guys are like, uh, they're blocking my services, I'm losing money because of this, how do we do this? And very much like you learn how to become an operator through the community, you learn through experience, anti-abuse is very similar. Um, much of that experience comes from being a part of the community. So I'm going to walk through a little bit about how MOG is trying to shortcut that, how MOG is trying to provide that experience and give, give you, give you, give you that, uh, give you, ca catalyze that knowledge base. So we're going to go through what constitutes abuse, how abuse indicators have evolved, and some of the fundamental economics of abuse and anti-abuse operations. So we're going to start at the conceptual level. So a very, uh, a, a well-known definition of abuse, at least in the anti-abuse community, is all information exchanges on the internet should be consensual, and unless you choose to receive traffic from a third party, you should not have to accept it. So like our little friend in the cartoon here, um, you didn't invite that guy to come knocking on your door to try to sell you something. You didn't invite him over for dinner. He's not, he's not really wanted. He's kind of, and the guy's kind of peeking out like, why are you here? Similarly, you didn't invite abusive actors to come knocking on your ports. You didn't invite them to come infringe on your services. So just because, so to link that kind of that abuse, kind of abuse that happens often at the application level down to the routing um, and operations level, just because there's a legitimate route to a destination doesn't mean all traffic using that route is legitimate. So this definition is nice and conceptual. It gives you a prescriptive ethos, but it doesn't really tell you much about practical application. So one of our senior technical advisors, Dave Crocker, gave me this really great, concise definition. Abuse is what customers complain about. And that's, a, and that's very practical on a number of levels. It tells you a little bit about how abuse has evolved from an ideological position that says, you're the bad guy, I'm not, and I can, and I can, and I can give you, I can put you on a blacklist, but rather it's just moving us from a subjective set of indicators to a more objective set of indicators. Things that are, that are based on, say, feedback loops, like whenever you click on this is spam in your Google Mail or this is spam in your favorite Gmail, in your favorite client. But as much as we strive to move from subjective to objective indicators, indicators are always error prone. I say this from the perspective of the pragmatics of, 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 in, of indicator development. I say this from the perspective of a researcher who knows that all models are wrong, some can be useful. In that vein, 
anti -abuse, the anti-abuse community is continuously developing and evaluating indicator performance. In, in, in MOG in particular, we're always looking at these indicators and saying, how well are these things performing? When we look at a blocking list technique or a feedback list technique, we're always going to the other side and saying, how is that working for you? Are we getting a lot of false positives or not? How can we fix that? It's that kind of collaborative engagement that really makes that in the, the, uh, the anti-abuse industry work. Um, an example of that, an example of how these indicators and how the problems have shifted is a shift from inbound to outbound. So early on, a lot of the focus was on filtering inbound spam. But now with the growth of malware and botnets, it's really starting to shift to a focus on outbound attribution, and that's a whole different set of indicators. Some of the very contemporary issues that the anti-abuse um, community is coping with is who bears the burden? Should it be senders that are bearing the burden? Should it be receivers bearing the burden? And ultimately, economics tells us that it's going to have to be distributed across the two. It can't just be one solving the problem. And again, we're back to that story of how do we get this collaboration going? So, now that I've given you a little bit of the context of what anti-abuse is about, what, what is MOG doing? Who, who is MOG? MOG is the Messaging Malware and Mobile Anti-Abuse Working Group, and it's where industry actors come together to work against botnets, malware, spam, viruses, DOS attacks, and online explo exploitation. All of these various instances of that general notion of, of, of abuse. So MOG is comprised of 200 member organizations worldwide. Those are companies. Um, at each of our conferences, we have about 300 to 400 different per, uh, di conference participants. So each company often sends multiple representatives. Um, one of the most important points is that MOG is a technology neutral, non-political working body focused on operational issues. So I really have to stress non-political. A lot of folks, when I first described MOG to them, were like, oh, that's another lobbying group. Great, they're going off and they're telling politicians what they want, they, what, what they want to tell them so they can improve their position in the market, so they can get good advertising, et cetera, et cetera. MOG is comprised of a diverse set of actors, such as senders, receivers, vendors, and, and it serves as a, as a community that brings those views together, and the objective is to provide legislators, policymakers, regulators with information about the implications of the rules they're making. Implications in terms of like whether that's going to make the industry's job harder or easier. Is, is this kind of, is the kind of rule that they're making going to have adverse effects on internet security? So um, the graph you see on the right there is, uh, is our most recent, um, our most recent attendance uh, breakdown for the San Francisco meeting uh, earlier, in, uh, earlier this year. And, um, and it's pretty abysmal in terms of diversity. We have a large number of folks from North America. We've got about 14.4% from Europe, and we've got some smaller slices that, um, that, fall, that fall well below that. So if we look at a map, this is where a lot of our, lot of our, lot of our participants come from. So I apologize I didn't put the color scale on the bottom, but it goes from purple to red. Purple means you have high participation, the bluish middle area means you have middle range participation, and the red means that we want to, um, that, that there's just a few participants from that particular country. Um, hopefully, next year, all of South America will be blue, ideally purple. We want to see, um, we want to see a lot of growth and a lot of participation from this region. Um, but here's the real answer. There's too many U.S. voices. Just point blank. I say this as a U.S. citizen. There's too many. There's too many U.S. voices. Not enough global voices, and definitely not enough black voices. So, I, I would love to see volunteers uh, step forward at the end of this at the end of this presentation. So, to unpack MOG a little bit more, what does that M cube stand for? So, what does that? What does What do those? Each one of those mean? Messaging is kind of the heart of what MOG started as as as, as combating email abuse. So, abuse on any messaging platform from email to SMS. We've branched out to start exploring malware and exploring um, the impact of malware. So we have both industry researchers and researchers and academic researchers, and we found that uh, this kind of abuse is often a, that abuse, such as uh, such as such as spam, is really increasingly becoming a symptom and a vector for viruses and malicious code. And the mobile domain addresses messaging and malware issues that are emerging on mobile as an increasingly ubiquitous platform. In terms of tapping your expertise. Um, the mobile market in the Latin American Caribbean region is much more dynamic than in the uh, than in Europe and the uh, North America region. We believe that there is quite a lot that we can learn about what's going on in the mobile ecosystem from 
your regions, from your economies, and we would love to get your feedback on that in particular. Um, so what does, what does MOG publish? What does it do? What does it develop? We develop best practices, which are some of these uh, documents that I have on the right. Um, we pr produce policy st position statements, um, sp particularly speaking to policy, and we do some amount of training and education um, on that area. So if you want to kind of get a feel for what some of the public policy and industry guidelines pre um, presentations look like, you can go to the website here. Um, a great example of this is seen a lot of uh, seen a lot of uses of the anti-bot code for, of conduct for internet service providers. So um, if we look at the two documents that are right on top, you see that you've got not only MOG there, but you've got some of the folks that we collaborate with. So who are the who who, who does MOG play with? We play with the London Action Plan, Internet Society. Um, you all know the Internet Society. I2 Coalition, which is all about hosting, and we'll, we're going to be talking more about that at LACSEC tomorrow. The East West Institute, we've gotten a um, cybersecurity award from them for our work in China and India. And the Anti Phishing Working Group, which I'm not sure if Boy is in here, but he's, uh, he's a representative of them. And uh, we do quite a lot of work with them on uh, best practices there. And now our most recent partnership is LACNIC, and we're really looking forward to updating our best common practices to reflect dynamics in this region. So, how does how does the anti abuse community develop? How does anti abuse community development work in MOG? So MOG relies on working group participation. We're not looking for free riders. We're looking for active participants that are willing to hit the ground running and contribute. Um, that working group participation is in the spirit of cooperation to create an effective and efficient anti abuse outcomes in a trusted environment. And so I broke this sentence up for a number of reasons, partly to just drive home each one of those points, but also to highlight that trust is the foundation. Trust is that very bottom of the stack that is the thing that on, on which all of our anti-abuse is uh, based on. So one of the, uh, some of the norms that you will hear is that you have to respect MOG anonymity. Hmm. Blogging, tweeting, posting, publishing content from MOG requires permission from the presenters and MOG itself. Um, anything that happens in MOG, we don't expect it to be distributed on, on the outside. The, the, the objective here, the outcome, is that MOG participants can safely share information critical to solving technical abuse problems, technical security problems, without the fear of retribution from other industry actors, such as competitors that don't necessarily believe in the ethos of cooperation and collaboration, but also it's there to protect us, protect the MOG community from the criminal element whose illegitimate businesses are impacted by anti-abuse efforts. Um, for those of you who have to deal with security on a daily basis, you, you, you know that these guys aren't just going to send nasty little letters. There's a good chance that they would do something really bad if they could get a hold of you. So that's, that's kind of sort of the foundations, the foundations of that trust and foundations of safety in the MOG community. So just as kind of a flavor of what you see, that we, we, we aren't just saying that as like, oh, don't talk to people, it's not an empty formalism. If you, if you go to MOG, you'll see this kind of, this kind of, uh, this kind of, this slide pop up at every presentation. It is a constant reminder that this, these are the norms of our community. We have a trust community that requires that you follow these, 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 uh, these, uh, these edicts. So where does the work actually get done? What, what kind of committees, what kind of groups do you expect to see? So we have a number of technical groups. I've already discussed the messaging malware mobile. We have a DDoS SIG. We've recently spun up uh, Internet of Things, in particular looking at um, uh, the, some of the emergence, emerging abuse uh, problems in the Internet of Things. Um, we actually have a few of the leadership on our uh, MOG delegation here. So um, we have the two vice chairs of vice chairpersons of MOG in general. So that's uh, Dennis Damon and Sarah Roper, who are standing up right there. Dennis is also on stay standing up. Uh, Dennis is also uh, Sarah too. Um, Dennis is uh, on the program committee, and uh, Sarah is co-chair of the collaboration committee. Thank you guys. You can sit down. Nope, nope. Again, up again. Sorry. Um, so there is also within the collaboration committee is the abuse desk and the anti-phishing SIG that again has a great deal of cooperation with APWG and uh, FOI from that group. We have public policy that does a lot of work um, distilling the best common practices, distilling what the community has learned from this information sharing to share with policymakers. Um, we also have the senders committee, which is represented by Tara. Tara. So that's Tara right there. And we also have the hosting committee, who is represented by a co-chair, uh, Justin Lane. 
We have pervasive monitoring, identity, so we have a very diverse set, and these, and these can be considered sub-constituencies. And one of the really powerful things about the collaboration at MOG is, historically, these guys haven't always gotten along. Senders and receivers haven't always been best friends because senders are sending out, potentially sending out all kinds of marketing messages and some very strong beliefs amongst receivers are like, oh my gosh, all of that's garbage. MOG has done a lot of work historically to mend those fences and to create an environment where these guys can communicate so that they can jointly develop indicators, so they can jointly give each other feedback on how reputation is created, how it's remediated. So uh, as the last point, um, I've been saying over and over again, please, please, please participate. Please come help us with our uh, best common practices development. We've spent some time breaking out um, low, medium, and high level of commitment. So we don't expect you to come and write an entire 20-page document and uh, have to do that all on your own. We have, we, have, we have tasks that are low time commitment, low expertise commitment, low accountability uh, commitment, all the way up to uh, taking responsibility for major MOG initiatives like being the chair of a committee. So we have a whole range of activities based on your level of experience and level of willingness to, to contribute. But Again, this community has a deep expertise in this region that we would really love to tap. So at that, I'm going to leave you with the, uh, with the MOG website, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you for listening, and I'm very happy to, would be very happy to see volunteers. Thank you.